moment you've been waiting for since last week is finally here. And we have with us none other than our local celebrity, Tab Murphy. Um, and Tab, take it away. Well, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things right up front. Uh, first of all, just to thank everybody for all the love and affection uh, and, and just sharing stories and, uh, you know, trading info and getting to know some of you and all of you really in, in so many ways. Thank you for just all the love and affection you've shown a movie that had really kind of been off my radar for a long time. So I really feel a lot of gratitude for the opportunity to kind of go back and uh, and uh, re kind of just reconnect with it in a way that I, I didn't get a chance to, uh, you know, when it was first released, mainly because I just, you know, I think I mentioned in the on the page that I just had no idea that there was such a rabid fan base for this film all these years. So this has just been stunning and kind of overwhelming and a lot of fun. And I'm so glad that I've been able to share uh, the things I've shared with you uh, this past week. Um, I just, uh, you know, want to, uh, first of all, uh, uh, give a couple of shout outs. One to, uh, my, uh, uh, Mr. O's, which is a, a bar and a restaurant that I uh, frequent in Studio City. They're going through some tough times, uh, you know, as we all are. So a shout out to them for, for uh, providing, uh, this evening's libations, uh, which, you know, <laughs> For uh, tender ears out there, libations is code for Uncle Tab's uh, Corona medicine. So, you know, cheers. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is, um, I just, uh, you know, all of that love and affection that's been, you know, been coming at me, I really have to share it with a lot of people because animation is one of the you know, most creative and collaborative mediums that you'll ever work in. And it's unjust for me to sit here and take all of your love and praise and just bask in it myself without acknowledging the fact that literally dozens and hundreds of people made my words and me look good through all of their efforts and talents. And it starts right at the top with producer Don Hahn and directors Kirk Weiss and Gary Trousdale. And just, I mean, you know, just dozens and dozens of animators and the art directors and the uh, designers and the character designers and the, it just, uh, and, and another, uh, you know, I mean, a great head of story in uh, John Sanford and, and another terrific screenwriter who added and produced a lot of material for the story named Dave Reynolds. I mean, some of you might be shocked to, to learn that, you know, some of your favorite lines or some of your favorite moments in the movies were not mine <laughs> necessarily. I may have provided the grist for the mill uh, in some ways, but, and inspired them, but they were written, you know, there was a lot of material that was brought to the table uh, during the course of the four years in the making of this movie. So, uh, I, as much fun as I've had this past week, I've felt a little guilty about, you know, uh, without at least at the top of this broadcast, acknowledging all of the tremendously talented and wonderful people I got to work with personally and those that I didn't, but who just brought their A game to this movie and ultimately created something that we all, you know, have been able to love, uh, some of us a lot longer than others. Um, and, uh, and, when, and what I also wanted to say about this page, too, is that when I first came onto it, I was, I don't know, you know, look, I'm, I'm an old guy, man. I'm 63 <laughs> or whatever. I, you know, I don't know what to expect. I mean, I have kids and, you know, my kids are in their 20s and some are in their teens and some are younger. I've got, you know, six of them. So I've, I've got the whole, I got a whole uh, like demographic that I can write for these days. But, um, you know, and I was just amazed. I just have to say I was amazed by you guys out there. You, uh, and what amazed me about it is, and I think I, it's owed to this sort of the idea that you all had a collective experience in watching this movie. And now you have found a place where you can come and sort of geek out and share your memes and your cosplay and your stories and your 
humor and your this and your that about something that touched you all. I mean, and so what I found in this page was that you guys don't tear each other down. You support each other. In fact, you lift each other up. And I didn't find any bullying. I didn't find any cynicism. I just found a lot of joy, man. And, you know, I just wanted to salute that and salute you guys for that because uh, that's a special, there's a, enough cynicism in this world, you know, and that's a special thing to find a place like this where I love coming and I know you guys love coming and uh, that we can all kind of, you know, break bread and share, you know, things about a movie we love. So thank you. And uh, I think that's it. <laughs> I'm wearing, you know, I was going to, I was like, I'm wearing my Seahawks, uh, you know, Corona mask uh because i thought you know i've talked i've left two videos for you guys and i was wearing it each time and i just thought screw it <laughs> tonight it's become like tab's corona trademark almost you know uh and my uncle pat by the way just left this chat because he's a rams fan but i still love him. <laughs> uh, so anyway i'm really excited to be here um and, and share whatever I can share. And uh, so uh, with that being said, let's go for it. Sounds great. And if you ever want to bring any of your other animation pals in the group or in another live stream, just let me know. We're, we're ready for that. And I'm sure everyone would be super excited to have them on and would have a hundred more questions. Um, we had a total of about yeah, can 250 I just say, can I, questions. Can, can I just say to that? Screw those guys, man. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> no, no, you're all mine. Mine. No, no, of course. In fact, I also that you just reminded me, I have to give a shout out to Tammy Tucky, who was, uh, you know, a grade A contributor to this site. Uh, I sat down her recent with her recently. She does a podcast with a couple of people you're going to want to hear from. And I don't want to steal her thunder because I'm sure she's going to make an announcement about it on this page. Uh, but it will be an awesome companion piece tonight uh, to, to whatever conspires <laughs> here tonight. Uh, and, uh, I, and I want to thank her. And you guys should, should show her some love, too, because she's the one that brought me to this page. She's, she's the one that suggested I join. And uh, so, Tammy, God bless you. Thank you. Um, Thank okay. you, Tammy, for bringing us a uh, tab. <laughs> um, and on that note, um, let's jump into it. So um, just to, to start us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started a writing, how you kind of got into animation, you know, your nerd beginnings, um, and how it all it all came to uh, to Atlantis in the end. Well, this, I mean, you know, I was really lucky because I, I got to grow up in the 60s. I was a kid in the 60s. And the 60s, you know, prior to the Vietnam War era, was a magical time to be a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, shows like The Munsters and The Addams Family and Outer Limits and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Time Tunnel and on and on and on. Those were all prime time shows for me. And for a young kid with a fertile imagination, I mean, it, it was just like, I was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, Batman, you know, the original was a prime time show. Johnny Quest, animated Johnny Quest was a prime time show when I was a kid. And all of those shows just sparked my imagination. Uh, but the real truth is I was a total monster nerd growing up. I was a monster nerd and in the 60s and well into the 70s. My safe room, although I didn't have any monster nerd friends, so I was just a lonely monster nerd. But I just wanted I brought this was my Bible growing up. Right. Famous. Can you see that? There we go. Famous Monsters of Filmland. And that magazine introduced me to a whole nerddom of monster movies. And uh, and in the 60s, the, the monster movies they were, you know, talking about were the, the sort of universal monster movies, you know, like Dracula, Frankenstein, and Hunchback. Quasimodo was kind of lumped into those. And that, when I was like nine, 
was when I first became aware of the story of Quasimodo and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So that's why it's, it's just, you know, everything like it's so weird to me that like a lot of the stuff that I got to work on in my adult life, including Atlantis and Hunchback and, and even Tarzan, you know, that you can follow the threads all the way back to when I was a kid, when I became aware of those stories and became aware of those characters and things like that. So, yes, I was a monster nerd. I still am a monster fan. I love monsters and horror movies and things like that. Uh, and, uh, so, but when I kind of graduated high school and went off to college, I went off to be a forest ranger because that's what everybody did in Washington, not go off <laughs> to be a forest ranger, but they went off to college and there were two colleges. You could either choose Washington state university or the university of Washington in Seattle. I went to WSU, which is clear across the state and, and, uh, about, and this was a sort of a seminal moment because about six six months in i'm sorry about that uh about six months in uh to, or the halfway through my first semester i knew i'd made a big mistake you know <laughs> i was like i thought forest ranger was going to be like riding horses and building campfires and in the back country and doing all this sort of romantic shit, you know that forest rangers do and it was all like biochemistry and all this hard classes that i hated and uh, so I had this sort of uh, epiphany and I remember coming back to my dorm room and being very depressed. And I, I remember just I, I stood in front of a mirror just like I am now. And I looked at my reflection. And I said, Tab, what do you really want to do with your life? What do you really want to do? And just don't think about it. Just blurt out the first thing that, you know, that, that comes to mind. And I looked at myself literally. And I said, I want to go to Hollywood and I want to make movies. I want to get into the movie business. I want to tell stories, and uh, and it's I don't, this could I could tell you about all the creative writing classes I'd taken, which I enjoyed, but never really thought of any. I could be a writer and all that stuff. This could go on for an hour. I, uh, so I'll just cut to the chase. I remember getting on the phone with my parents, and I called them, and I said, uh, "Look, this just isn't, isn't working out over here." And they said, "Well, what do you want to do, Tab?" And I said, "Well, I think I want to go to Hollywood." And get into the movie business and now my parents are from a small town in washington right so i could have said i think i want to fly to mars and terra firm half of it and build a colony i mean they <laughs> just had no you know like but you know to their credit and i always love them for this because i think there's a point in a lot of young people's lives where they're kind of on the cusp of a dream maybe to follow and they might in you know get some bad advice or and it's not even bad advice it's not intentionally bad but parents can be protective in 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 ways that you know can stunt somebody's desire to pursue something that they're that's meaningful to them and it's not your parents are just being protective they're just like my parents could have said well you don't know anything about that you you have no experience why don't you do something safe and do this and do this but to their credit they were like we don't know anything about that but if that's what you want to do we'll support it right so i think there's a lot of moments in you know young people's lives where they they if they get the right amount of uh, or in that moment of doubt or desire they get some support uh it can just make all the difference I mean, that doesn't mean that they can't, won't still go on and do something or pursue something, but it's always great to have a little bit of, we're with you, man. We're with you, <laughs> no matter what. We don't know. You could go down in flames, but we'll be there beside your side. You know, like that sort Absolutely. of, that, like we're in this together, go for it, you know. So my parents were great. I transferred down to USC Film School in 1976, and that's really where it began. Uh, and then I, you know, but I came to LA and I came to film school and I grad and I did, I never graduated film school, by the way, I dropped out. I'm a dropout. You're having a live chat with a college dropout. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, put that in it context. Turned out, turned out great for all of us. So it was <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> So. But I mean, the, the point is, you know, like I didn't really, you know, like I didn't, I've told this story a few times that, you know, and I, I got out of school and look, I, 
was in film school. I had to move home to my parents back into my bedroom and I had to work at a Safeway on night crew for a year because I ran out of money. I mean, we all have that thing where we're leaving the nest. See you, mom and dad. I'm never coming back. And then like six months later, uh, hey, it's just me. I, yeah, I got to live at home again and, you know, or whatever. Uh, and so that happened. And But I finally, I remember this, I you know, I had an old typewriter. Some of you know I had a typewriter. Yes, that's how old I am. Uh, but I bungee corded it onto the back of a motorcycle I'd saved up for. And when I finally left after that year of living at home and I said, I am not coming back. I'm not coming back until I make it. So, you know, I'm either you're either going to see me again or I'll be dead. But, you know, one of the two, <laughs> I'm kind of not. So and away I went. And that so when I landed here. You know, I went to work at a 7-Eleven and I started writing. I started writing scripts. And uh, one of the things that was really cool at USC when I was there is that I took a screenwriting course. And I had a somebody, that teacher of that course, took an interest in me. And again, this is just that kind of like the hand of fate touching you on the shoulder where there was, you know, that two dozen people in that class. But for whatever reason, he singled me out. And he took me aside and said, look, I think you got to kind of an aptitude for this so i think you know everybody and their grandmother wants to direct movies in hollywood but I, if you really want to do that i think the way in is to to write screenplays is to be a good writer and i took him at his word and literally dropped out i don't think he was counting on that dropped out <laughs> dropped out of school like at, at the end of the semester and i thought fuck it I, oh i just dropped an f-bomb tender ears sorry Hey, listen, that may happen. I apologize in advance. So I dropped out and I went, you know, and I went to work and I just started writing. So that led to my first job in Hollywood. Eventually, um, uh, I got to write for an old friend of mine, David Kirkpatrick at uh, Paramount Studios. He ended up running Paramount. Then he moved over and he ran Disney for a while. Great guy. We re reconnected him over the years. Uh, and uh so I was, but I still wanted to direct. I wanted to direct movies. That's why I was there. And animation was not on my radar. Anyway, uh, I got, I'm just talking. I'm going to cut to the chase because nobody wants to hear about this bullshit, really. I mean, the fact is, so I was, I got a movie that came together. I was going to direct it. In the meantime, uh, a lot of the guys that had, I'd worked for originally at Paramount had moved to Disney. And Jeffrey Katzenberg was running the Disney animation division. And he was like reaching out to screenwriters he'd worked with, trying to get them to come in and see about maybe, you know, working uh, and writing animated features. I kind of resisted that for a while because I just was so focused on live action stuff. So I said no to a lot of things. I have the dubious distinction of having passed on Toy Story. Uh, right now, there's like probably a tremor in the nerd world over hearing that, but it's true. Uh, and I can make nerd jokes because I am a nerd, by the way. Uh, but I did. I passed on Toy Story. Uh, in all fairness, uh, the way it was put to me, though, was that I would have had to move to Marin County, commit to two years up there. And... Uh, uh, and and the, it was pitched to me as about a boy and his talking toys. And I was like, oh, man, I'm trying to get a movie made here, man. I don't want to write a movie about a boy and his talking toys, you know. So that was an easy pass at the time in hindsight, which is always 2020. So uh, anyway, I, you know, we got the actor that was going to star in my movie. I had a but he had like two other movies to make before he could do mine. So I had this window of opportunity. And man, you know, I had to pay bills honestly. And it's like a lot of people have this idea that, you know, working writers in Hollywood or anybody in Hollywood is just, just by virtue of the fact if they have a credit, they're automatically rich or this or that. No, no, no. We all have to work. We all have to pay bills. We have mortgages or rent or, you know, we have to eat and all those things. So I had this like five month window where I, I needed a job. And right at that time, uh, Disney called again and said, come on in. And I said, okay, I'm going to come in and see what uh, what you guys are doing, what you're up to. So I went in and I had a meeting with them. Uh, David Stanton and uh, Kevin Bannerman were the executives in those days. And uh, 
we had a meeting and it was very nice. It was awesome. They showed me a lot of the projects they were working on at the time. Nothing really caught my attention though. And I just, I'm the kind of guy that like, I gotta like find a hook. I gotta somehow find a way to love it. I can't just do it if I don't feel it, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm just not gonna, you know, like collect the paycheck if I can avoid it. Uh, and at the end of that meeting, I'll never forget, they said, and we're also trying to figure out something to do with this. And they threw the, or not threw, but there was, they lifted up this big book and it was Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now, I've already told you I was a monster nerd from the 60s and that Quasimodo had been on my radar since I was nine years old. And I was like, I didn't even, I'm in, I'm in, I'll do it, whatever, I, I'm in. You know, like I was just like, you know, it was awesome. I mean, I was, you know, so that high. was, and I'll, you know, that's for another time at, uh, you know, a hunchback at another, and uh, get into the mechanics of how all that came together and working on it and the choices and the decisions. And, but that was such an awesome experience for me to work in a, in a medium that I, up until then, it just thought was cartoons, which I had nothing against cartoons, by the way, but I didn't know that and I think when I when they were talk I didn't know that they could have the kind of power that I wanted to to write about the kind of emotions and the kind of emotional content and the mm -hmm. and the themes and 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 so I was blown you know like that was such a great experience that I got asked to do Tarzan which was again like oh my god man are you kidding me Tarzan you know I remember watching Johnny Weissmiller Tarzan movies when I was three four and five years old so yet again here are these things coming to uh, to me that resonate so deeply with my childhood you know and you just can't say no to that stuff right um so it's uh and then so then after Tarzan it was like I had such a great time with Kirk and Gary and Don on Hunchback and they wanted to kind of keep the team together as it were. And so they were like, what are we going to do next? Right. And that next became Atlantis. And uh, I guess that's kind of where we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and so the birth of Atlantis, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of mythology even surrounding that, to tell you the truth, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I remember, you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of places where Atlantis came from. Uh, it came collectively from our childhoods. It came from a desire for Kirk and Gary and Don to want to do something different than what they'd been doing. They'd been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture for Beauty and the Beast, which, by the way, shook up. Hollywood. I mean, just like yeah. shook. They were like, "What the fuck? That's a cartoon." You know, <laughs> like that gets nominated for Best Picture. It just changed the landscape about how the rest of Hollywood saw animated movies. And like literally overnight, every studio was trying to, you know, setting up a division of animation and trying to duplicate Disney's success. Um, but uh, but really, I think you know. So. You know, there's been a lot, and this is kind of a story that's been bandied around, and it's a story that's uh, relevant to the birth of Atlantis because it's true, it really happened. And that is that Kirk and Gary and Don and myself went uh, one day and had lunch at a Mexican restaurant in Burbank, Chevy's, I think it was. And uh, Don likes to tell the story that he had chips and guacamole and, and nachos and guacamole, or whatever. I don't even remember what I ate. But it was really, and I think by that time, we all had kind of collectively decided that we wanted to make a different kind of movie. We wanted to, as Kirk used to say, you know, he, he they'd been making movies in fantasy land. They wanted to take a left turn and they wanted to go into adventure land and Disneyland and make a movie mm -hmm. about it. all the movies we sort of loved growing up as kids, you know. And so I was totally on board with that. So I think that my recollection of that lunch is that we just sat around and we talked about the kinds of movies we loved uh, growing up, you know, Swiss Family Robinson. And they weren't necessarily Disney movies, Journey to the Center of the Earth, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, all those kind of movies that were kind of like great adventure stories that, you know, hadn't really been tackled as an animated 
movie to that point. Um, so we kind of, you know, we just, I don't even, you know, we banned it. Like, I don't know how, you know, many story ideas we actually came up with in that meeting, but I think what we really, what really cemented it for us was tonally what we were looking for, what we were, what we wanted to go for was just pure adventure as they, <laughs> they used to say, less songs and more explosions, right? So yep, yep. I mean, that's, that was the t-shirt everybody wore, you know, around, uh, which I never got one, damn, and I wish I had, uh, that, that's just brilliant. Someone actually um, asked a question about that and uh, asked if you, you if you still have the shirt um, and there you have I it. I never got one, answer. Ralphie, I never got one. See, <laughs> the, that's the problem with being a writer on an animated feature is that you're heavily involved in the first, you know, year, year and a half. But all the fun shit happens, you know, when in the like year two, three, and four, when they handing out T-shirts and swag and all this stuff. And where's Tab? <laughs> oh, he's nowhere to be found, man. He's working on something else. Mm. But uh, so out of that meeting at that restaurant in Burbank, I came away and I brought to them what I posted a few, you know, I don't know how many days ago now, but the very first thing I posted in terms of the pro progression of the treatment phase was, was the capsule ideas about what the movie could be about. And at that point, we didn't even know. It was up for grabs. I mean, it could be Atlantis. And I think I listed some things even in that first treatment that they could be, that our explorers could be searching for. But we hadn't even found it, our hero yet or anything. It was just explorers going into the earth, and uh, and then I've also posted sort of the progression of treatments through that phase, including my misfire treatment and then getting back on course. You know, it's like Milo, like, go down that tunnel. And I went down that tunnel and there was nothing but a deep, dark pit of despair. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, and then correcting and getting back on course and then leading up to the treatment I dropped today, which really, I think, was the was the point where that's not the treatment we turned into the studio that was still a ways off that was still quite a few iterations off but that was the treatment that i think we all kind of looked around at each other and said i think we're on to something here man <laughs> pretty cool you know so uh i mean you know i can keep going i mean because that ultimately we worked on that treatment more and a lot of the characters that you know in that treatment in the treatments you guys have been reading about started to really come together and take shape we added more team members and Kida became Kida and started to take shape and all of these things are but they're all a development process right and some of the things in the movie aren't found until a lot farther down the line than some others are and that's just uh mm -hmm you know, how, how, how it is in terms of development, you know, but there are certain ideas that, you know, I'm proud of that began at, in the earliest iterations that are still found in the movie. And, and so that, that, that's a really cool thing to me, you know, sub pods, for instance, sub pods, man, those are mine. That's what I call them. And that's how I envision, and you know, and that's the beauty of working in animation because I can come up with an idea and I can say sub pods and that these little tiny submarines, but then I came in and I saw what the artists had done to it and it's like magic, man. It's like magic mm -hmm. seeing these things come alive, you know? And that's really what the process is as a writer for animation. You are really more or less a spark plug for, the you know for the rest of the team to generate ideas and scenes and, and and flesh out you know characters and this and that you're just you're a spark plug early on and then the and the rest of the engine begins to run on that spark plug and and starts to you know you get up to speed and man before you know it you're flying and it's great it's awesome absolutely so what were what what were a couple of things that you had in some of the earlier versions that didn't make it to the final movie that you just really wish had made it through? Uh, well, you know, most of <laughs> I told you I was a monster nerd, right? I would say most of that stuff is monster based. You know, I, you know, I have to say, I have to, you know, hats off to Kirk and Gary and Don because, you know, they, 
allowed me a, a lot of freedom in the first draft that a lot of writers aren't allowed on animated features because mm -hmm. we had such a wealth of ideas. And when I was ready to go to script, and I think eventually the treatment, I mean, you guys have a treatment that I think is clocking in at about 14 pages right now. I think the treatment ultimately that went into the studio was about 25 pages. So there was, as we fleshed it out and got more and more stuff, and frankly, I think we had enough material for two movies, to be honest with you. But when I went to draft, and you know, animated features for the most part are like, you know, 90, 95 minutes, you know, which is about a 90, 95 minute screenplay. My first draft was 155 pages long, I think. Wow. Something like wow. unheard of. Unheard of, really. To be able to just. And I said to them, I said, guys, I said, there's a lot here. I mean, what, you know, do you giving me any marching orders <laughs> as I go to draft? And I don't know who said it, but I, well, I think they all collectively said it, said, just put it all in. <laughs> you know, like there were no, there were no, and I cut, let's cut this, let's, do this. no, they were like, put it all in. Let's see, see what we got and play with it and uh, all of that stuff, you know. And uh, so mm -hmm. the stuff that ended up getting cut was, necessary to get cut in order to tell the story that ultimately became the story of Atlantis because I you know and we were talking about this the other day I mean uh, you know and they boarded a lot of those scenes and a lot of the monster stuff and the journey to Atlantis was long and there was adventures and this and that but I think they were like you know I don't know what they the, the team wasn't getting to Atlantis until like page 45 or 50 or minute 45 or 50 of the movie. And they realized they used to call it a monster fest. I think Kirk told them. they used that. That was the nickname for the, the early, you know, when it was up on reels, it's monster fest time. Uh, but you know, it's like one of those things in, in when you tell a story, eventually things, speak to you that even though they love being there they tell you we don't really belong here because the real story is in atlantis the real story is with the characters and the emotions and you know and the explorers and the and the betrayals and all of the human stuff in atlantis the adventure the monsters are great they're cool and there's a couple in there but it's really you know that's the real heart of the story the heart of atlantis is the heart of the story right so mm -hmm. I love that connection. <laughs> um, so what were some, a lot of people were asking about what was your inspiration while you were writing the story and why you chose uh, the era that you did and gave it kind of that, it had a more kind of steampunk um, feel to it is how some people describe it. So what were some of the things that you used as inspiration when you were building this world and Atlantis and, and the characters and the expedition? Well, uh, we we all love the time period, 1914, 15, 16, whatever. It was kind of loosey-goosey, but I think I always said it was 1914. We love the time period because it was it was a new age of technology right even though we look at it as steampunk and but in those days all of these machines were new and uh we were coming out of a century uh that was kind of uh that felt old into this new century that had a lot of promise and you know there were still places in the world in 1914 that were unexplored you know what i mean and that was a huge part of what we wanted to we wanted to you know uh, be in a place where we could believe that there was possibly a place unexplored that we could go to and bring our team to and under the earth made a lot of sense and ultimately atlantis made a lot of sense uh for the mythology of the story um but i loved i just loved it because you could like for instance a character like cookie you know this is a guy who you know was a cook for general custer you know in my you know sort of thinking and you know, as a young man, right? And here he is in 1914 going down in a submarine, right? Into the earth with a bunch of explorers and he's cooking just like he did for Custer. Right? You know, like, and it was just like, we just had a lot of fun with that, you know, stuff, man. It was just like so much fun and it just felt right. It's a lot of times, you know, 
you just go on gut feeling. And we, I think the guys got off on the idea that they could create, you know, a look, an aesthetic for the movie set in 1914 that would just feel different and, and would also harken back to a lot of the adventure films we watched as a kid, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it was the, you know, it was the birth of flight and the age of flying machines and zeppelins and all sorts of cool shit, man. I mean, really, yeah, that's yeah. we were just into cool shit, and the, we wanted to, we talked about it all the time, you know. And uh, so it was, it was, you know, that's really it. I mean, it's not a big, uh, there isn't a big revelation there, other than it just felt like the right time period for us, you know. And it felt like we wanted to give an ode to a lot of characters that we loved in movies growing up like Mr. Whitmore, the strange billionaire benefactor, you know, the mysterious, and Helga, the femme fatale, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so, I mean, we could use all of those great characters, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, that's really the answer. Great, um, and you can obviously see all of that in the, um, the first time that the Ulysses appears, a lot of people were fascinated by the submarine and its construction and its grandeur. Uh, okay, you asked me if there's one thing. I, okay, I and I know there's a lot of you guys on this site that feel the same way. I would have loved to have seen that submarine stay around for like another mm -hmm. even 10 minutes, man. Absolutely. It was so cool. It was so cool. And I'll never forget, you know, because I had uh, the guys had a production offices, I think up uh, where they were the, before they went to the animation building. They were up near the Burbank Airport, I think. But I remember going to visit it. I'd been gone for six months, you know, doing other uh, moving on, or I'd gone off to make my movie or whatever it was. But I remember going up and visiting, and they were showing me around and showing me all this cool stuff. And the, they took me to this. They showed me this replica of the sub. That was like, I want to say it was like five or six feet long, fully detailed, fully loaded, beautiful, just beautiful. And I wanted to just like grab it and run. I wanted to stuff it <laughs> in my trunk, drive home uh, or move out of state and just keep it for the rest of my life. It was that cool. It was so, so cool. So, yeah, the <laughs> sub. I love the sub. I love that whole sequence. It's just and, and James uh, score there. It just every time I watch it. I just get chills. I get chills. I like goosebumps mm -hmm. when that when it's released and boom, that the, the score swells and you just that great shot, you know, that they design that starts and comes past Milo standing on on the deck looking out like, whoa, you know, I'm just like I'm just like 13 years old again, man, when I see that. Absolutely. One of our members specifically commented, seeing it blown up five minutes after being introduced always makes me sad. So we definitely well, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. No, I know. They could have actually, you know, if there was ever going to be a sequel, uh, you know, I, I, they should resurrect the Ulysses and the way we'd go, you know, because it was just the coolest mm -hmm. thing. And I know the guys had a ball with that thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the aesthetic of Atlantis itself, it's it's definitely it definitely draws draws inspiration from uh you know south american kind of indigenous cultures uh and uh someone asked why was why was that kind of the route you went with to to create that that world well that wasn't the route i went with see a lot of those decisions you have to understand you know i wrote you know a story about explorers going to atlantis and i could write in a script you know i don't have I don't go into sort of pages of details about mm -hmm. what Atlantis looks like, what the people of Atlantis look like, the fact that they're tattooed, that the fact that they draw, those are all influences that are brought on by the, the artists, the designers, the art director, the set. I mean, you know, like the, all of the, 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 all of those, that's what I mean about, you know, it really takes a company of it, it in this case, uh, you know, two or three hundred people bringing all of their, you know, talent and, you know, but ultimately those decisions rest with the directors, with Kirk and Gary and, 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 and Don as well. Those guys 
are really the ones you need to ask those questions to because those guys would be able to tell you that we were, for instance, and I don't even know if this is true, but for instance, we were looking for an aesthetic for the Atlantean people and one of the artists did a drawing that we said, that looks cool. Let's explore that. Where does that come from? Well, I was looking over at some Aztec stuff and I borrowed some of the, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. in terms of me as the writer, you know, my, I'm, you know, you know, I'm trying to put in as much as I can in a very limited way to give them sort of jumping off points to then go and take and explore ideas for what it could look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how Atlantis worked in terms of being underground and, you know, we were talking the other day and there's a, a, a very talented, uh, uh, animator illustrator named Lisa Keen, who one day brought the directors like this, 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 uh, you know, like this illustration of what she thought Atlantis could look like. And they were like, that is cool. And like the water comes off and it cools the lava that creates the steam that gives Atlantis clouds that creates kind of artificial light that day. And, you know, and so, I mean, it all, everybody contributes. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it, you know, like so when I go to the premiere, which I didn't go to the premiere, actually, truth be told, I was out of town and I took my five year old son at the time, six year old son at the time and a cup and a bunch of his buddies to a theater in Calgary. And I saw it with them with a big buckets of popcorn. And it was the coolest thing. I mean, it's the cool. It was the coolest thing because I got to see it with like younger versions of myself as I would have seen it at my age, you know? So it was really special, really cool. But, you know, when I saw it, I was like, wow, I was just as blown away in so many ways by what I was seeing because I'm finally seeing the, you know, the, the endeavor, the artistic endeavor of a collective group of people with a vision being led by, you know, the triumvirate of uh, Don and Kirk and Gary to create this, this movie. And it's like, exploding my eyeballs out because I'm seeing things I never in a million years imagined. You know what I mean? I mean, so that's the beauty. That's the fun of it, man. That's this, that. And, you know, for those, for me, my small contribution to this movie and the other movies um, to be working, you know, for Disney, which, you know, it's just going to get the red carpet treatment. They're going to bring the A game every time. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the fun of working in animation and, and that Disney does it right. And every time I started one of those movies, you know, and Hunchback, it was all new to me and I didn't really know what to expect. And there's a lot of funny stories about that. But by Tarzan, I knew and I knew that I was going to work on something really cool and really special. <coughs> Excuse me. Corona, Corona. No, not true. But uh, I... Uh, and by Atlantis, it was just like, I mean, it was just like full on, you know, like joy to work on that, that particular movie with guys I'd already know, I already knew, we already kind of had a shorthand about how we did things. And, you know, half the time I, you know, like we'd go in and have meetings and, you know, I mean, it was the most fun I ever had because you know, we might schedule an hour and a half and we'd spend an hour laughing and we'd finally like with a half hour left, okay, let's get down to business. Let's, we better figure this shit out. You know, whatever. It was like, oh man, it was too much fun. Just too much fun. I wanted to talk about Helga a little bit because I, you know, insinuated that she was bisexual and that lit a fire and everybody's like, oh, Helga's bisexual. Helga's. Look, Helga is whatever you want her to be or need her to be. When I said I, you know, that she might have, that she might bat for both teams, I only meant that for my reference. That's my reference to her writing her. I, I thought that I, I used that to write her in those early iterations. That doesn't mean that anybody else thought she was bi. By the way, that's not canon as I see that word bandied about a lot on the on the site. Uh, Kirk and Gary, you know, Gary's probably like, she was not bi. What are you, nuts? You know, <laughs> or anybody else, you know. Although, whoever animated her, I'm telling you, that guy, 
he was on the same wavelength. Absolutely. Okay? He was on the same wavelength, okay? So you have to keep things in context, guys. Uh, so Hel was Helga by? Yes, to me, as the writer, when I was writing her character, yes. That doesn't mean she's by to everybody or even anybody else on the production for that matter, except maybe the animator. So, uh, so just, you know, like it's not dogma. It, and, and these characters are whatever your connection is to them, whatever you want them to be for you. That's what they are, man. That's what they are. Okay. So that's the answer. <laughs> on that note, um, why don't you give us some more details on Helga's backstory? I know you posted some uh, some things about the characters already on the on the group, but just give us give us the, the cliff notes of Helga and and how she. Well, came it, to be. you know, Helga's backstory for me wasn't very detailed because Helga was the she represented every femme fatale in every great 30s and 40s movie you'd ever seen or that I'd ever seen. I mean, sexy, alluring, dangerous, tough as nails when she had to be, you know, kind of like, you know, and she was a perfect foil for Milo. You know what I mean? In that regard. And uh, so, I mean, she was really easy to write uh, because I just wanted her to be, you know, like, you know, if she was in a detective movie, right, she would be the suspect of a murder that the detective and she was too smart for that detective you know and she just was so i loved her i loved writing her and that whole scene in the you know there's like i said there's plenty of places in that movie where you guys have favorite lines that i didn't write i i promise you i didn't write because there was so many other contributions to this but there are some things in that movie i did write some things that i will take credit for and authorship for and one of them is helga it, it, waiting for milo in his apartment and him saying how did you get in here i came down the chimney ho 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 <laughs> that's my line okay so that was helga that's all you need to know about helga that the first thing she says you know i came down the chimney ho 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 that's all you need to know about her man I mean, that, that's all I needed to know about her. With that line of dialogue, she just like crystallized, right? I knew her. I mean, that was great. I was so fun to write her. Uh, other lines that I will take credit for. Nothing personal. Nothing personal. Those are, my, yeah, that's mine, man. I love those, you know. And those guy, lines get quoted a lot. That makes me feel really good, of course, obviously. But, uh, you know, somebody, there's a lot of other lines in there that are great that aren't mine. So, you know, uh, and, you know, but general story stuff, because that stuff is, uh, you know, is always tweaked and worked on. And that's why they have a head of story. That's why they have storyboard artists. That's why they have story artists. That's why they have another other screenwriters that come on and do, you know, sort of the daily work of, of a production because a movie like an animated movie doesn't just start at the beginning and, and start, we start animating at the beginning and then we just work our way through all the way until we get to the end. No, the movie starts, they start animating every scene, you know, lots of scenes in the movie and pushing sort of this way with it, pushing this way rather than this way. So, you know, and as they, they're animating sequences, ideas come up and writers need to work with those sequences and change them and tweak them and whether that's the dialogue or the action or whatever. And one writer cannot be in 12 different places at once, you know, on a daily basis. That's why other writers are always brought into that process, you know, to assist that. Uh, so that was, you know, Helga was great. Uh, uh, you know, Rourke, I mean, you know, I knew that guy, like, uh, you know, like in my early iterations, he was a bad guy from the beginning. So all they did was just make him kind of a good guy in the beginning. Then he got to be the Rourke I wrote for the rest of the movie, right? You know, so, I mean, you know, and uh, there was this, you know, like all sorts of, you know, Cookie was Cookie. There's not a lot of backstory there. I told you, General Custer and you know, I mean, so, you know, that's kind of it. I don't think there's any other characters, really, that we need to talk about tonight, do you? 
Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think anyone cares about <laughs> any other characters. <laughs> um, so before we get to the part everyone wants to know, uh, I did want to ask you um, to give us some more details about Audrey's character and how she came to be kind of this major engineer in charge of this entire expedition. Well, Aud Audrey was, yes. Audrey was great all the way, by the way, not, a, I didn't dream up every character. I mean, I submitted a list of characters to the guys, you know, the, the very first characters that I came up with were some French dude, uh, and Cookie, Helga, Milo, obviously Rourke and Vinny, who I think in the iteration that I posted today, his name was Chi Chi. Still, I mean, it was Chi Chi, you know, he wasn't Vinny. He changed to Vinny, but he was essentially the same, the same uh, character uh, that he became in the movie. So those were the characters initially. And then I, sub I remember submitting a list of other characters to the guys that we could pick and choose from. But like, uh, like Mrs. Packard, for instance, I think that was a Don Hahn suggestion. I think Don was like, why don't we have this? You know this old lady who you know used to run the telephones like you know like uh, Ma Bell back in the day, and we'll have her be the communication. And we were all laughing and going, "Yeah, let's do that." I mean, that's it was just free It was freewheeling, man. And then we uh, and I don't know who came up with sweet. I mean, I don't know. I have to go back. Look, I have a lot of material in a storage locker up in Olympia, Washington, that I'm going to dig out, including my first draft. And the first draft will verify a lot of stuff, further stuff, obviously. There were also characters that I dreamed up that didn't make it into the movie at all. Uh, there was a, a character named Zoltan for the longest time. He was like a medium, a, a, a psychic, who was a, a, a brought on the expedition. He was hysterical and he was there for the longest time, but he got dropped eventually, you know? So there was other, so, uh, you know, like Dr. Sweet, <clears throat> I don't know if I initially came up with that character or one of the other guys did, but, you know, that was more of a character that was that that, that was not something I brought immediately to the table. I think that was, uh, I think I brought a physician character, but that became Dr. Sweet or something. I can't, you know, like we're talking 25 years ago, man, third, you know, like literally I realized that that treatment today was d uh, dated one January 97. So I, we started this movie in 1996, you know, so, wow, you know, 24 years ago. Right. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that was, oh, those characters, then we all kind of agreed on a, on a team. And Audrey, right now, I mean, you know, I think the first iteration of anybody mechanical was a, a team of mechanics that I called Mike and the Mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that they were, in my mind, they were from like, they were Latin, they were a group of Latino mechanics. And they, they, they were just like, and that group became ultimately the character of Audrey. Now, how I can't remember exactly how we arrived at Audrey, whether Audrey was in my first draft. I kind of think she was because I there were three or four other treatments that were done before I went to script. And I think all of the major characters were pretty much, including a couple of extras, were cemented by that point, including Audrey. So it's, you know, but again, you know, you're asking an old guy to try to remember stuff that happened 25 <laughs> years ago. I apologize, you know, but Audrey, she was awesome. I mean, I still say to this day that I was lucky enough to write a Disney movie that had four strong female characters in it, not just one, not just one like Esmeralda, you know, in Hunchback, four. I mean, when you think about it. So we had Kida, we had Helga, we had Audrey, and we had Mrs. Packard, who in her own right was badass, man. She Absolutely. smoked. She smoked. And she took no shit from anyone. Marge, I got to go, you know. <laughs> well, you know, well I mean, said Maureen is going down, attacked by a giant monster. Yeah, and yeah. And, smoking and, you away. Know, and, yeah, how many characters in a Disney movie smoke, by the way? Think about mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah. So and that was, that we, was we, got away with, we got away with murder on that movie, man. <laughs> 
that was another question that came up. How, what kind of challenges did you face while building this story in this movie since it was different from the Disney movies up until that point and it had that kind of more, you know, um, like science adventure element and all these sort of darker characters and storylines? Well, I think that was indicative of the fact that we did not want to do anything that had been done before. We wanted to push the envelope in the opposite direction and we wanted to be smart about it. And we wanted to create a character in Milo who, even though he was a kind of a nerd and a bumbling guy and a little bit, you know, like I always love, <laughs> there's a shot in the movie that in some ways it's just perfect for Milo. And, you know, we know he's smart. He's already proven that he's in linguistics and he's, you know, he's passionate and all this stuff, but he's still like tentative and he's still like a little kid. And there's that moment as they're embarking on the expedition when Rourke looks over and he's, and he touches the horn, he squeezes it, you know, he's just, <laughs> he's just being a little kid. That's you a know? great moment. <laughs> right? He, yeah. I mean, and, and so... We just thought we want, you know, and that was part and parcel to why we did not want, even though in my early treatments, you're seeing some more traditional sort of hero princess moments. We really had to sort of purge that stuff because we didn't want it to be a romance per se. You know, we didn't want to fall into that trap and those tropes, as it were. We wanted it to be, you know, by the end, we didn't want it to be about, you know, like, like Beauty and the Beast was a romance, as Kirk reminded us. And this was not that. This was adventure, balls to the wall adventure. And that's what we wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, by the end of the movie, it just wanted it to it be a speeding bullet train of action you know, that ultimately ends is satisfying because emotionally things end up the way we want them to. But so, yeah, it was a, it was a completely different animal. And everything we did in that movie in that regard was intentional to get away from, you know, things that had already been done and familiar tropes and, you know, kind of, you know, you know, whether that was white princesses with blonde hair or, you know, whatever it ended up being. So we were we were very uh, aware of trying to do something different. That's really the answer. Yeah, and and we're glad you did because it, it it really came through. And I think that's why that's why it has stayed it has stayed with so many people after all these years because it's you know it's something very exciting to watch compared to a lot of the other classic Disney stories. So. We're glad, well, glad you made that. I, I think another a reason why is that we we wanted to be really smart. We wanted to be a smart movie, not a you know, mm -hmm. not a pandering movie, not a movie that uh, only spoke to little kids. Because I can't tell you, you know, we wanted to like we wanted to invite kids to like come toward us rather than just sit there and let us give you what you wanted. Come toward us and learn a little bit, uh, learn something new and be inspired by something you don't really know about and something you haven't seen before. And we wanted to cr create a movie and I think we were very successful, although this was never really, I think, formally spoken amongst us, but I think we wanted to create a movie that not only we could go back and watch as kids and appreciate, but that we could watch as adults and appreciate as well. Mm -hmm. The ideas in there, the, uh, you know, the sort of the, the sci-fi elements, the mystical elements, the spiritual elements, the action stuff, you know, the, the guns blazing and crystals taking over bad guys shit you just don't <laughs> see in Disney movies. I mean, it, you know, it was, yes, fewer songs, more explosions. That's <laughs> right. That guy got it right there, or gal. And the movie, the movie ended up inspiring so many people were saying how it inspired them to be um, historians or go into linguistics and archaeology all because. That is just incredible to me. That is just old. That is just incredible to me. And it's the ultimate. I don't, I don't know if it's the ultimate compliment, but it's the ultimate, you know, the idea that when you 
sit down in this dark space and you start writing words and then you just hope that you end up inspiring somebody with what you create because that's what we all as artists want to do we don't want to sit in a vacuum and create our art and just put it on a shelf and just enjoy it ourselves i mean we we create and express ourselves as artists because we want to share that with the rest of the world you know and as a screenwriter that's a uh, it's a pretty iffy, uh, you know, kind of uh, situation because screenwriting is a weird type of writing, you know, as an artist, because you really are relying on other people. You know, screenwriting is the only art form where you rely on an intermediary to create what you created for the rest of everybody to see. It's not unlike a sculptor who... A sculptor who can sculpt and a painter who can paint and a novelist who can write who's just a novel that puts out screen we rely on directors and producers and in this case hundreds of other people to imagine this you know take what i've written or the other writers have written and 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 create something that you hope is going to connect with an audience right and that's not always the case as a screenwriter i mean we you know, sometimes you write a script and it's turned into a shitty movie. And sometimes you write a mediocre script and it's turned into a good movie. I mean, <laughs> you don't know. I mean, once in a while, you just don't know. So it's a weird kind of uh, writing. And that's why I have to say, you know, in so many ways, this last week has been so special to me because, you know, when, when you're a screenwriter, rarely do you get read by anybody other than the director the producers and you know in the case of atlantis maybe the animators but the animators aren't they're not reading this going oh i gotta call tab i love this script i gotta tell them how great it is no they're like you know they, they read it and they're like how do i make this awesome <laughs> you know or if they kind of like it how do i make this awesomer you know <laughs> so you just you know you, you don't nobody reads you you know, nobody goes and searches up the script or the, you know, and that's why this, why is that so noisy? That's why this week has been so special for me because as a writer, you guys are reading shit I actually wrote. You're not watching the movie and, and, and then allocating all of that movie to me erroneously, not your fault, not your fault, but you're reading me. You're reading stuff I wrote. And so that was extremely gratifying over the course of this week to post that stuff and have you read it and and enjoy it and have questions and comments. And, and you know, like uh, a couple of people said, reading your stuff was really fun. And, and that's just like gold to me because I rare i don't get to hear that stuff you know what i mean as a as a screenwriter nobody reads my scripts right so anyway i digress it was definitely a very exciting discovery because you tried to be sneaky about it with that post that was like oh i wrote i wrote the movie and all i got was this animation cell and i didn't know i didn't know how to you know i like to <laughs> good you guys know i like to fuck around i don't take myself seriously i have a lot of fun and i didn't know how to enter this group and i didn't want to you know be a dumbass about it so i just thought well fuck it i'll just you know post something silly and see if and so honestly i was unprepared for the reaction and so that's you know part and parcel why i just felt like i really want to share this with these guys because these guys are the real deal they're the real deal and uh i respect that i have nothing but respect for the people on the site and you know the imagination uh and uh, and the content that's put on it is i mean there's more imagination on that site and i know it's there it's like splattered all over the page like roadkill you know like fresh roadkill every day it's just awesome so i mean you know keep it up i, I think it's, it's just so much fun to be a part or at least to participate a little bit in a collective love of something that that touched you all you know and that i was a little part of i mean that was that's it's really cool man really cool we're, we're, we're glad you're enjoying it as much as we are and um i think uh i think it's about time to wrap this up and we're getting to the final question that people have been screaming in the comments since we started and for the past week 
Uh, tell us about Malt. Tell us about his backstory, where he came from, and what did he say to Kida? All right. Okay. Okay. All right. This is a big one. And, and that sound you hear is uh, nerds around the world leaning into their computers right now. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, and I don't want to disappoint you guys, but, you know, like I have to say, you know, you might be because, the, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you know, even though Mole, Mole was a was a uh, was a character that I created. I think one of the first team members I created was Mole because it was like they're going into the earth. They need a dude who fucking digs dirt. They need a dude who knows. And, you know, like, how do I get that guy? Who is that guy? What is that guy? All of that stuff. Right. So um, I had. You know, so what happened was I came up with the idea that I got to find, okay, this character's got to be like a mole. He's got to be like a mole. He's got to know dirt. He's got to be able to taste dirt. He's got to like darkness. And he's got to like all this stuff. And he's got to dig. And he's got to be a digger. He's got to be like a mole. So out of that, like, came Moliere. Okay, that's, yeah, Moliere. He's a Frenchman. And his nickname is Mole, and he's an expert on dirt, right? I mean, you know, that's – and then I had some – and I don't – a lot of times, you know, just like with Helga, right, me thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to write her like she's bi because that, to me, makes the most sense for this character. So I had some ideas, very general ideas about Mole. Uh, I didn't share those ideas with anybody. They're mine. They're my ideas of what I use to write that character. So I've seen a lot of stuff written about Mole. Everybody's got a lot of theory about Mole. And that's all awesome. And, and what I want to say about that is that all of that stuff is relevant, guys. It, it Because you know what you do on this page? You know what you're doing? You're sharing ideas. But you know what you really are? You're storytellers. You're storytelling on this page about characters you love. And that is awesome, okay? So I would never say, oh, that's wrong, or that's wrong, or this is not right, or this is right. I'm simply going to share with you my story of Mole. And, and my story was very just general. So, and I, you know, thought about this over the last couple of days because I thought that this is such a thing for these guys. I got to. So I filled it in a little bit. OK. <laughs> but this was my story for Mole. Mole was born in 1865 in Paris. To wealthy parents. And for the first five years of his life, he lived a very privileged and luxurious life as a little boy. At age five, he was diagnosed with a very rare skin disease that he was super sensitive to UV light, AKA sunshine. His, so a, a room, a bedroom was built for him in the basement of the big mansion and that's where he lived. And he had one oil lamp for light and it provided just enough light but not enough to you know to mess with his sensitive skin right and over the years his parents distanced themselves from a boy that they felt was unpresentable and as Mole grew older, he would turn his oil lamp off for long stretches of time. And he would, even though he was lonely, darkness became his friend. Okay? And he would then turn it off all the time, except when his caregiver came to give, you know, to feed him. He preferred darkness. Darkness comforted him. And one day in that room, in that dungeon, 
could be a bell tower, couldn't it? <laughs> he found some ants in his room and he followed the trail back and he found a crack in the wall where they were coming out of. And he started to dig out the wall a little bit and pull out some boards and he uncovered dirt. So when Mole was 11 years old, he dug his first tunnel and he dug out of his room and he dug straight up and he came out onto the lawn of that big estate and it was nighttime and he just stood there and he gazed at the stars and he just gazed at the stars. He'd never seen them before like that. So he went back down and for the next week, he came out and he tunneled up and he would stare at the stars at night. Well, his dad called in an exterminator because something was digging up his lawn. I don't know, was that me? I hope not. Uh, and so the exterminator came to his father and said, look, in a French accent, by the way, you either have the biggest fucking mole in the world or, <laughs> or but or somebody is digging up your yard well that somebody the parents discovered was their son so to make a long story short and you know what i'm going to do guys i'm going to type up this into a little two-page thing and i'm going to post it for you okay please do this is not canon okay this is my this is tabs this was my touchstone to this character so there's a there's a great line which i didn't come up with where sweet says i don't want you know whatever the line is i don't want <laughs> he she told me and i don't want to hear blah, 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 about mole right i mean that whole thing so mole when he was a teenager he went to work for an undertaker and his 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 job was to dig up and exhume bodies at night. That's the thing for relocation in different in cemeteries that were being because Paris was growing and expanding in cemeteries. The dead had to be moved. That was Mole's job for a while, digging up dead bodies. And that's the part Sweet tells. Audrey told me, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you. You don't okay. want to know. You think you want to know, but you, you don't, don't want, want to know. Yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> and then later, as he grew older, he came under the tutelage of a geologist. And all of his obsession about dirt and digging and everything came into focus for him. Right? That is Mole's backstory. Now, what he said to Kida. I'll tell you what he didn't say. He didn't say, uh, are those your real boobs or were they just drawn that way? Okay, he didn't say that. <clears throat> he didn't say, you're water, I'm dirt, let's make a little mud. He didn't say that. <laughs> what Mole said, and this is straight from the director, so I know it's true. And you know what? The truth is it's not much of a secret because you guys already cracked it. It's already been listed on the page a few times. What Mole said to Kida is, Congratulations okay. to everyone who guessed it right, you guys. <laughs> yes, you guys, right? You guys are awesome. That's what I mean, you know? So that's what he said. That's what the actor said. They dialed it down. They got the first lines in there and then they dialed it down. But this is, again, I want to I want to talk about a little bit about uh, the jokes and the need to know things because whatever Mole said to Kida really isn't important. What was important was her reaction, bam, which was mm -hmm. fucking awesome, right? So there's an old saying, right, that my girlfriend reminded me of, and it goes something like this. Don't dissect the frog. OK, and you know what that means is that you're walking along and you see a little frog jumping around. And you go, oh, that's awesome. That's pretty. That's funny. That's cool. 
I'm going to dissect that frog and, and see what makes it do that. Well, when you dissect that frog, all you end up with is a dead frog, man. Enjoy the frog jumping. Enjoy the frog doing whatever it's doing that makes you laugh. Don't feel the need to dissect the frog every time, is what I would say. After all these years of us watching this movie, we're just trying to dig up. No I know, intended. I know, I know. No, listen, I don't, I don't blame you at all. I don't blame you at all. But I'm just saying there are certain things and I'm happy because the truth is I didn't know the answer to that until the director told me exactly what was said. But it, I didn't care what was said because in my mind, in my imagination, I imagined exactly what he said, that squirmy, mm -hmm. dirty little guy, you know? I mean, you know, so it's, you know, and that's half the fun, you know? It's like, you know, a movie that can, you know, let you sort of play along with it and add to it with your own ideas and imaginations. Uh, that's that's great stuff, man. That's great stuff, so. That was great. And I'm sure we're, we're all looking forward to uh, seeing the full, the full write-up of, of his backstory. You look at a full write-up of Paul. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and uh, it's the least I can do. I mean, this you guys have been so amazing, and, and I've had so much fun. And, you know, yes, I'm going to dig out that box of Atlantis stuff in storage up in Olympia, Washington. At some point, I will post the 155-page scripts, probably in 20-page increments over a few days, just so, like, you know, because I, you know, my God, you know, that's that's a lot, you know. But then you'll really see the first draft, I think, was the draft, that sort of free-form, everything-in-it draft where you're going to see all sorts of cool stuff that didn't make it into the movie, but, you know, uh, but again, you'll see how it progressed and progressed and and then, you know, as it got passed off to animators and uh, story people and other writers, it just blossomed into something that was so unique and special to everybody working on that film. And that's why, you know, like I am just uh, filled with such gratitude uh, to have been able to spend this time on this site with you guys over the last week. Uh, because honestly, you know, as I said before, I... It's, it had been off my radar for a while. I mean, I look, I'm all, I'm proud of everything I work on. You know, I mean, I really am, but I was especially proud of Atlantis in so many ways. And not just because of, uh, you know, I got a, a sole credit on it or because, uh, but uh, you know, this or that. And, but by the way, that sole credit is kind of misleading because there were so many people that contributed to, you know, the story and the characters and the dialogue and stuff. So, yeah, anyway. But my point is, it's a movie that, you know, collectively Don Hahn and Gary Trousdale and Kirk Weiss and I, you know, sat around and, and dreamt up, you know, together as a, as, a, as, a, as a love letter to all the movies we watched as kids, you know, Disney movies mainly, but a lot of others too, that sparked our imaginations and, and felt left us feeling like, ah, yearning for adventure and you know wanting to go home and play those characters and all that sort of stuff right so mm -hmm. anyway well thank you again for taking the time to chat with all of us today uh it looks like everyone has been enjoying uh the stream despite all our little difficulties here and there um and i'm sure we'll I call it, and we'll most of those were my fault by the way <laughs> my fault i got shitty well, internet you know, I mean, anyway, so we're, but you we're, were, we're making it work. Thank you so much. No, 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 it's great. And listen, down the road, if you guys want to do a part two, I don't even know if there's there's probably other questions that didn't get answered or there's we'll plenty. figure out some forum. We'll figure out some forum to answer some of those questions. I'm happy to do it. It's always, you know, look, I, I, you know, when I was, you guys don't realize how lucky you are. Really, and I, I don't mean to say that in a way. I don't want to say, like, when I was your age, I had to walk five miles to school through a snowstorm. That's not what I'm talking about. But when I was your age, I didn't have a forum like this, a safe place to go where I could meet other people that loved what I loved and share things with them and talk about it and, and, uh, and just sort of revel in this part of me that I thought was 
nobody else knew about her nobody else shared her and you know like that is just the coolest thing you know so anyway i just had uh, to hear it oh it's it's really great and everybody in here is so cool and so fun and uh funny and you know and and generous and uh so i just you know i i want to keep you know giving you as much lore and you know answer as many questions as i can you know so it's it's the least i can do honestly we're looking forward to that for sure Awesome. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. These videos will be up on the group and I will also be uploading them on YouTube and I'll uh, combine the two videos so you have one uh, cohesive interview all together. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, you know where to find Tab <laughs> and uh, we'll see you around the group. <laughs> thank you. Everyone. Thank you guys. Have thank you. Guys. Much love to all Bye. of you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And thank you, Cornelia. I appreciate it. No problem. Bye, everyone. Bye.